Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Robin Minter Smyers, the partner in charge of the Cleveland office of the law firm Thompson Hine and a proud member of the board of directors here at the City Club. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown Law Center and author of Not a Crime to be Poor, the Criminalization of Poverty in America, Peter Edelman. I've had the distinct pleasure of knowing and admiring Peter Edelman and his wife, renowned advocate for children, Marion Wright Edelman, for the past 40 years. They were some of my earliest heroes and remain so to this day. Here at the City Club, we've discussed the issues pertaining to race, mass incarceration, and the future of criminal justice reform from a variety of perspectives. Today's speaker adds another layer to that conversation, the intersection of poverty and race. Today in America, 10 million people owe governments a total of $50 billion in accumulated fines and fees. Many of those fees go unpaid, not necessarily because of criminal intent, but simply because the people affected are too poor to pay. Being unable to pay the costs associated with America's court system can land you in jail, establishing a vicious cycle that devastates families and communities, especially those of color. Today's speaker has dedicated his life to anti-poverty work. His most recent book, Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America, illuminates how, through a variety of Reagan-era tax cuts that created revenue gaps, we've established a justice system that criminalizes poverty, and that's what we're here to discuss today. In addition to being the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown University Law Center, Mr. Edelman is also the faculty director of the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality. On the faculty since 1982, he's also served in three branches of government. During President Clinton's first term, he was Counselor to Health and Human Services Secretary Donna Shalala, and then Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation. He later resigned from the Clinton administration over the 1996 Welfare Reform Bill. He was a legislative assistant to Senator Robert F. Kennedy and was Issues Director for Senator Edward Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1980. Earlier, he was a law clerk to the Supreme Court Justice Arthur J. Goldberg. Mr. Edelman also worked in the U.S. Department of Justice as Special Assistant to Assistant Attorney General Doug John Douglas. A graduate of Harvard University, Mr. Edelman has been a United States-Japan Leadership Program Fellow and was the J. Skelly Wright Memorial Fellow at Yale Law School and has received numerous honors and awards for his work. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Peter Edelman. Thank you, uh, Robin. Uh, <clears throat> as, as Robin said, this is a family affair. Uh, we've been friends with Stephen Dolly, um, I think maybe before you were born, um, but certainly going back almost 50 years, uh, Steve, when you were in Massachusetts. And, and uh, you won't know, but you will now know that when he was uh, Deputy Secretary of uh, education in the new Department of Education under President Carter, he uh, got in touch with us and said he wouldn't take the job if he couldn't live in our house. Uh, <laughs> and he did. And so uh, by that time, I was in the uh, Ted Kennedy uh, campaign, 
Uh, and so he'd go there and I'd go there and then we would meet at night to kind of compare notes on where things were. So lots and lots of memories and so wonderful, Steve, that, that I'm here on the auspice of the Stephen A. Minter uh, Endowed Forum. That, that's very special. Uh, and the other thing, beyond uh, how wonderful it is uh, to be here and to see all of you and uh, the long history of, of the City Club is to um, come in, <coughs> in tonight and there's Robert Kennedy. And if you don't know, I'm sure most of you do in the room, is it was the day uh, after Dr. King's murder. And, and the speech uh, that was uh, so famous in Indianapolis, uh, which, which was uh, uh, historic, and, and uh, I think we all uh, around the country, so many of us can almost re recite that. The speech that he gave here uh, is enormously important, enormously important. And if you haven't read that, I urge you to, to dig it up and, and look at it, because it really said, uh, what needed to be said there at that terrible time and, and what it meant and where we needed to go uh, as a nation. So that's very special for me uh, being here. Well, I have uh, worked on, on uh, these poverty uh, issues for a long time, um, I'd say largely, but more than largely, really because of Robert Kennedy uh, when we lost him. Uh, not in any melodramatic way, but, but something about me said I needed to do whatever I could uh, to, to uh, carry on what he did with reference to issues of, of race and poverty uh, in our country. Um, but the book that uh, I'm here to talk about has about it um, mostly things I didn't know anything about that were largely new for me. Um, what happened in my eyes, and it probably is true of many of you, beyond the killing of, of, of Michael Brown uh, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, was a city that was abusing uh, its own citizens with unbelievably exorbitant fines and fees uh, for so-called quality of life crimes and, and then sending them to jail when they could not pay, 21st century uh, debtor's prisons. And uh, I began once, I began noticing uh, in the New York Times and New Yorker and other places uh, around in, in one uh, media or another um, that when you, when you started uh, taking the dots and connecting them, that was going on all over the country. Um, you take a, a, just one example, a man named Adel Edwards from Pelham, uh, Georgia, um, who has a significant intellectual disability and can't read and write. Well, he was fined $500 for burning leaves without a permit and another $528 for so-called probation, so-called probation of a for-profit company. And when he couldn't come up with an instant uh, demanded first payment of $250, he was sent to, to, to jail. And of course, there are thousands uh, more of such stories uh, around the country, not just in places that we think of as uh, being different from us. Not so. Uh, Pure and simple, it's, it's the criminalization of poverty. Uh, it's a systemic way for states and communities, um, really all over our country, to raise millions of dollars, including from the poor. And, and right now, as we all know, uh, the conversation today is in the context of people in Washington uh, trying yet again and looking like they'll succeed I hope everybody says something to, about it before it happens. Um, reducing the taxes of people uh, who have no need for a tax cut, to say the least. 21st century debtors' prisons, 
the rich get richer. Well, that's why I wrote this book. If you go into any uh, municipal courtroom uh, any morning uh, in places around the city, in, including, I'm told, in Cleveland, uh, but I, I saw it for myself in New Orleans and, and uh, uh, talked with people other places. St. Louis is one. Um, and what you see is the same place, and I'm talking particularly about in municipal courts, uh, mayor's court here, as I understand it, um, men and occasionally women, near, all and nearly African-American men, uh, Latino, other parts of the country, Native, Native American, but in orange jumpsuits. And they're there because uh, they either were uh, arrested on a uh, very, very minor misdemeanor or violation uh, or... Uh, something that's going to end them up in losing their uh, driver's licenses. Uh, and, uh, or uh, they're back because they couldn't pay what had already been, uh, that, that they'd been sentenced for. Uh, and so uh, there's a bench warrant and they're back again. Uh, if, if it's driving, uh, it's so easy because people have to drive when they have a Lose, lose their license, so they get arrested again, and, and the, the money just piles up. Um, they get, uh, they get uh, as part of their sentence, uh, if they don't get sent to jail right away, which happens too many places, they get put on a, a phony kind of a, of a probation, which in many states, 13 states, is a private, is a, is a for-profit a company, but it doesn't matter. It, 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 all over the country, states, I mean, this is shocking to any of us who's got a little bit of gray hair uh, that this this happens. You, you know, probation, that was something, well, you know what it was. And Anyway, this is not that. This is phony. Uh, and so $40 a month or whatever it is, uh, uh, is is part of it. And it just goes on and on. People, people are just hooked. Uh, and so that, that's what, and, and it, 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 some people end up in jail at one place along the line, but even if not, their wages are garnished, uh, their tax of refunds are seized, and debt collectors hound them. So it's like being jailed without bars. And here in Ohio, I'm sure many of you know that there are some counties uh, that do uh, the uh, suspension, suspension of the driver's licenses, not for things that are necessarily having anything to do with driving. Or if they do have something with a car, it's like a broken tail light. Uh, and this is, this is a pattern. This is not, I'm not picking on Ohio. Uh, I've, I've seen the same thing. Now, even after I finished reading, uh, writing the book, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Oregon, uh, it's, it, everybody's doing it, and, and it's, it's heavily, uh, the, the things like Adel uh, Edwards, which is terrible, uh, uh, that, that's uh, less, uh, you don't see that as much as, as you do, most of it is the driver's license suspensions. So uh, in Ohio, there are places where uh, you get the suspension for failing to appear in court, for failing to pay a, a fine, uh, uh, as I said, nothing to do with driving. There's no in inquiry into the ability of the person uh, to pay, and the, the uh, suspension can be indefinite. So uh, that's a, a nutshell of, of what's going on. Um, so why did all this happen? Uh, in, in two words, Grover Norquist. Maybe some of you don't know his name, although there, there are, uh, and the, the young people will, will talk to you about, uh, did you know Grover, Grover Norquist? No. no. Okay. Well, here's what he said. Uh, it's okay. We didn't expect you to. Uh, that's what you're here for. Learn. Um, what he said in motion, here, here's what his motto was. Shrink the government to the point it can be drowned in a bathtub. And uh, that wasn't just being a, a sick joke. He led the anti-tax revolution. Th that's what we're doing here with all of this. 
Now, I'm going to come to some things later on that aren't about this, that aren't about money, because all of this is also about race and poverty. Uh, it's not just about money. Uh, it, it, it is uh, race and, and poverty uh, as well. But what happened uh, in the anti-tax uh, rebellion was that starving for revenues, uh, states and local governments all over the country turned uh, shaking people down, uh, especially uh, low-income um, people uh, of color. Um, I was the other day, I was with the Chief Justice uh, uh, Ralph Gantz of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, and uh, a, uh, he, um, we talked about this, I've talked to him a number of times. Uh, the, as we are here, uh, finally, after he went and, and others went to the legislature to say, we've got to cut this out. We've got to get this money some other way. This isn't fair. And year after year, he couldn't get them to stop because once you're addicted to that money, once you bite the poisonous apple of this, it's hard to stop. Uh, and finally, in, in Massachusetts, uh, they have a, a legislature that's listening, and there, there's a bill that's passed both houses of, uh, that, that's 150 pages. It's other kinds of criminal justice reform uh, as well. So um, this, is, this is national, and it's hard to get rid of it. So what do they do? The, the government's jacked up fines and, and added mountainous fees that had no, no connection with, with uh, the violation. Um, and uh, pay for everything. I mentioned about, about the, the uh, probation, uh, but all the way across, whether it's diversion, and if you can't pay for the diversion, uh, then you, you, get, um, you have to be tried, right? Because you, you didn't pay for the diversion. Uh, you're, you're on um, a probation, uh, or you're... you're uh, waiting for, for trial, and they did let you out, and of course, with bail, you might not get out. Um, but um, the, the, uh, the, the money is there, people making money off of all this. I mean, you know, the, the, we know about the, the prisons, but it's way, way bigger than that. And they're asking people, uh, state after state, not only these things that are related to that, the court and the things like probation, but room and board um, in, in um, jail, in, in, pri in prison. And so um, uh, Robin talked about the 10 million people owing the $50 billion. Two out of every three current and former inmates, two out of three, Say that again. Uh, current and former inmates owe unpaid fines and fees, and that includes the fees for their staying in prison. It's big business. It's big business. Um, it's, really, it's really modern peonage. It reminds uh, us of, of the share cropper economy that held families in financial servitude, always ending the year owing the plantation more than they had earned from the cotton uh, crop and therefore obligated to continue for another season. Vicious, un unforgiving cycle. Well, it still is. Now, it's worse than that because our criminalization of poverty metastasized. And I think these things are all, all connected. Children in school over the last, particularly last 20, 20 years, instead of being bad enough to be uh, suspended when they shouldn't have been or expelled when they should not have been, in uh, virtually every state, they're sent to court. Now, particularly, this happened after Columbine because uh, the federal government put out uh, $750 million to add 6,500 school resource officers, SROs they're called, in 3,000 schools across the country. And you know who usually was the kind of children in that school. And in Texas and Wyoming, they are sent to adult 
court. Or women who call 9-11 to seek protection, and this is an issue you have here in Cleveland and you've been working on it, and indeed some wonderful work by, by I believe they're law students, who uh, actually caused in some of the communities within the county here to get rid of those ordinances. What are the ordinances? Well, here uh, in, in Ohio, uh, what they do is they say to the, the uh, landlord, uh, you, your tenant there has called too many times uh, uh, under our ordinance, and uh, so you're fining the landlord 250 who passes that on to the tenant who then says, I can't pay, and result, uh, being evicted. There are uh, places that are uh, even worse, and, and by the way, uh, there's also people who fight back, just as the work that you've been doing here, but uh, lit litigation, especially done by the ACLU, usually uh, gotten to the, uh, to the uh, ACLU by the local uh, legal aid, uh, and, and uh, winning litigation that actually in uh, Pennsylvania not it not only got uh, Letitia Brick, Briggs uh, a, s a settlement when uh, her she was badly injured by her former uh, boyfriend to the point where she had to be medevaced out of, out of there well she did get a settle that high price of 500,000 got the ordinance knocked out in that town and the whole state was su such a horrible such a horrible thing. And in Maplewood, uh, Missouri, uh, that's in that whole St. Louis, uh, Ferguson area. I wonder what the water's like down there. Something, they, they really have some interesting laws. When a woman tenant uh, calls the police too often in Maplewood, they can ban her from living in the town. Ban her from living in the town for six months. Like she'd want to come back, but anyway. Uh, now, the, the, the good story is two lawsuits that we have pending there. Uh, one, a civil rights lawyer, a terrific good friend in, in D.C., and again, the ACLU. Well, the, the, the criminalization of poverty goes on. The, the, the fraud charges against public benefit applicants and, and recipients, uh, uh, whether it's TANF, uh, whether it's a housing voucher, uh, where uh, the, the things that people have done are, in, in so many cases, are not something that really was violating the, the, the law. They're used to, to deter people from applying for help, really. Certainly true of, of, of TANF. And, and people uh, in, in so many parts of our country now prosecute vagrancy laws even more than in the past. A big number added. Uh, just in recent years, so the point comes to the point where, where uh, somebody who's homeless uh, is not allowed to sleep in the car, not, not allowed to sleep uh, in the park, uh, sitting up, down, standing up, uh, the point being get out of town. And that's just uh, in too many, many places. This is all about the criminalization of poverty. These things all uh, fit together. Uh, the, the whole question of, of mental health uh, in, in our country. I mean, look what's happened. Um, and it's an old story, but, it, but, but, um, but it's a terrible one because uh, the community mental health programs that we needed uh, in enough a measure so that everybody can be served aren't. So people go to jail, and that's the mental illness institution that we have in our country now, the jails and the prisons. It's all about the same subject. And when we talk about bail, and you, I know that you're, you're working on bail here uh, in, in uh, Cuyahoga County and a number of counties uh, uh, with the Arnold Foundation, and that's absolutely terrific uh, to, to uh, move on that. But understand what we're doing here nationally. We, we have 700,000 people on any given day in, um, uh, in jail. Uh, and they're there, 450,000 of those 700,000 people have not been found guilty of anything. Not been found guilty of anything. They're in jail because they can't pay bail. 
So uh, it's a major, major thing in, in talking about the whole question of the criminalization of poverty. Why do they do it? Um, the, it costs a lot of money to keep people there, but uh, they haven't quite figured out, except when, when you start doing what, what you're doing here locally uh, uh, on that, um, they, people can't, they haven't got the money to pay for the bail, right? Uh, and sometimes the family comes up of it and does something it's because they're low income. Uh, and so they go sell their plasma to, so that their loved one can get out. Well, that's the number. 450,000 uh, people. Um, so it, it's just extremely, extremely important that we fix money bail uh, in, in our country. Um, the, these are the things which, all of which I've said are constitute, and there's more that I didn't cover. Uh, payday lending, for example, uh, would I think be something that I should have had a story. Um, so, I hope I'm shining a light on, on what happens to poor people um, in, in this in, uh, aspects of our criminal justice system. And we have to act, and people are doing it uh, on, on some of the issues here, and uh, uh, you've had leadership from your chief justice uh, on, on these issues, which, which I think uh, is, is, is helpful. Um, and we're seeing uh, results in a variety of ways. Uh, one example uh, on the litigation side, not just it's so important person by person, legal aid, public defender, to get every person who is pushed around in this way not pushed around. And then to take that and, and uh, get a whole policy knocked out is, is the case. Thomas Harvey of the Arch City Defenders and uh, Alec Karakatsanis of Civil Rights Corps uh, obtained a 4.75 million settlement for almost 2,000 people in Jennings, Missouri. There we go with St. Louis County again. Um, 2,000 people right next door to, to Ferguson, uh, people who had been injured by the, the fines and, and fees. Uh, Alec uh, Karakatsanis again and partners, and by the way, private law firms uh, partnering, partnering. Uh, very important. Couldn't do that without having the pro bono lawyers from, from the major firms. Very, very important. Uh, the the uh, Sarah Harris uh, County, Houston, Texas, uh, has been declared their whole bail system unconstitutional uh, in, a, in a federal court, uh, and, and it's on its way through uh, the, the appellate courts. 193-page uh, uh, opinion, uh, just a remarkable, remarkable effort. So there's a lot going on in about all of this. There is legislation in places around the country. Uh, in California, uh, uh, which, which had four million people who lost their driver's licenses, the legislature's gradually pulling down from that and, and moving away from that. And on, on the uh, charges of, of, of uh, juveniles, where you have the fines and fees and state after state uh, uh, assessed on children and their families in the juvenile system, uh, even worse. Um, and in, in California, they're gradually, they legislation this year that uh, all of the fees that they, they had are uh, wiped out. Uh, they, can't, they will not do it for, uh, going forward in, in the state of California. So you can do these things. And uh, Lenore Anderson organized the Proposition 47 uh, in California, uh, which is now we're talking about decarceration. We're talking about large reform. And it happened because people organized and vote in an initiative to change the whole system in, in California. And she's now working state by state uh, for other states to do that. And ultimately, we need to end poverty uh, itself uh, because we cannot, uh, we, the, what all of these things about decarceration can't hold if people get out uh, or, or aren't convicted if they don't have jobs, if they don't have housing, if they don't have mental health services. So ultimately, for a lot of reasons, we need to be, uh, 
we need to be uh, ending poverty. Uh, and and uh, I went around for about uh, to seven different places in the country to look at really, I think, important things that are going on in a positive way about ending poverty. And ultimately, um, we have to create a movement. I think we have a movement uh, on mass incarceration. We need a movement on, the, on these issues that I'm talking about uh, today. But ultimately, we need, and we saw something pretty good last night. Uh, <laughs> and if, a few Tuesdays ago, what happened to uh, women stood up right all around America. Some men did too. Um, so it gives us hope because that's the, that's the ultimately thing that we need is is, is the pol political change that's really going to change our nation's direction as a, as a whole. And of course, we look to young people. Um, that's so important. The law students that I teach and and uh, your generation is 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 uh, you're going to fix the whole thing. But, but you gotta get out there. We all have to get out there. The real solution, Brian Stevenson says, uh, is uh, the real solution to injustice is, he says, the opposite of poverty is justice. And secondly, I always end uh, whatever I say uh, anywhere is to quote Rabbi uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, and of course, thinking about Dr. King uh, here in relation to what we already talked about, uh, they were dear friends. And uh, uh, Rabbi Heschel said, he wrote, wrote a lot of big books, but on this one, uh, he was, he was uh, uh, tweet, tweeting uh, <laughs> before it existed. Um, he said, we are not all guilty, but we are all responsible. Thank you so much. Okay. So many echoes of other speakers here. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I should say, too, that for those of you, especially the students who are interested in Grover Norquist, he was on the stage just two weeks ago on the 4th of December, and you can, you can watch that. Katie Scott, assign it to your students. All right, I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive here at the City Club, and today we're enjoying a forum with Peter Edelman, Karmic Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at the Georgetown Law Center, and author of Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. We're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our webcast. If you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are content coordinator Bliss Davis and Youth Forum Council Chair Tiolu Orsanya. May we have our first question, please? While you're bringing the microphone uh, to Colleen, uh, Grover Nordquist has, uh, on this subject, it has been helpful. Just want to be clear about that. He started the problem, but <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> That's a good lesson. Um, I wonder, Mr. Edelman, if you could talk more about the issue of driver's license mm -hmm. suspensions. In Ohio, I think the number is 32 different reasons that people can have their mm -hmm. driver's license suspended mm -hmm. that have nothing to do with driving. Right. Um, so can you talk about maybe solutions you have seen or strategies that you think are worth pursuing? Well, you, you, you have to uh, start paring that away. Um, and so, uh, Look at the and and also due process, uh, because uh, in a lot of these things uh, they take away the license. In in D.C. we have some legislation right now in the city council. Um, people who don't even know that it was taken away, so that's one thing they they should at least know what's what's going on. Uh, secondly, uh, wh why do we have taking away driver's license for something that has nothing to do with driving? Indeed, why, even if it has to do, uh, it's not dangerous in any way. It's, it's you know, as I said before uh, about the uh, tail light. Um, so we need to simplify. We need to, to, to pare it down to the suspension being for something that actually is important to our community to... to uh, 
uh, have safety on the road. That's, that's the purpose, not these other things. And to the extent that, the, that they're raking in money uh, using that uh, effort, that, that, that strategy, uh, with, that's how in California they got up blue state, although it had some red times. But um, the, for the four million people uh, who lost their licenses, it's, it's about money. Um, so th those are the things that we need to do, and, and uh, it, it, uh, the easiest, I guess easiest, but it's, you know, it might have to be county by county. Uh, it certainly can be uh, things that, that the court itself does by, essentially by policy that, that it, it can do in instances where they're not mandatory to, to, to have them. So there are different, different players in it. Um, but uh, the idea that, that somebody who didn't pay uh, on, on something that's totally un, not related to it uh, had, loses their driver's license, that, that just isn't right. But there's a whole, uh, all of those things that need to look at what the particular things, definitely need to, to uh, find out if the person is able to pay. That's very, very key, and, and it's just not done in, in a, lot of, a lot of courts uh, here in this state. So that's some of it, anyway. Okay. Oh, okay. So I have a, uh, by the way, thank you for bringing uh, the light on this topic. It's easy to live a privileged or charmed life, so to speak, and not think about how someone else's lives have turned to shambles. So thank you for that. But I have an observation and a, and a question. So the observation is that as these uh, these infractions, whether you know whether minor or not, are imposed on people uh, disproportionately to people of color, pe people who are poor. I think about that as being having to change the the hearts and minds, right, mm -hmm. of the people who are in charge of uh, tagging somebody with this infraction. But then also just that spiraling down that happens, that you get in a little bit of an incident, some people have the skill set, the resources, the guidance, the advisors in their lives, so it doesn't spiral down and they don't blemish their life and they end up in, in jail and then they can't even get a job. So could it be that you pay with community service if you don't have the money to pay? What's the systemic fix? Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, systemic, first of all, uh, is cleaning out these things that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be crimes at all. Uh, and that's part of what they did in uh, California with, with uh, Prop 47. Uh, they didn't, it's, it's not 100% finished, but, but uh, thing, th there's so many things that have, uh, for one reason or another, but some of it related to what we're talking about, there are things that are uh, criminal that really aren't. Uh, now, you get down to things where uh, you definitely want them on the, uh, on the books, and you want them with a fair uh, punishment or sanction for them, right? And when you get down there, you get to your question. Uh, and the, the, there isn't, I mean, the, the good judges really struggle with this, and, and there are good judges uh, that, that do. Community service doesn't work for everybody. People have jobs, and you have to figure out, uh, it's not to say you can't do it, but uh, whether actually there, there are the hours, and given with family and all other things, whether that'll work. It's, it's, it's just a little flag on it. Um, the other one that, that people do, uh, it's, it's not one or the other, is a payment plan, but modest sums. That, that are the do fit uh, with what they're able to pay. So instead of saying that uh, every month uh, they owe hundreds and hundreds of dollars, uh, it, it might be five or ten dollars. But it says we are, we're not just saying we're forgiving you. you know? we're, we're not just saying, oh, that's perfectly fine, you did that, because it's not. 
So those, I think, are the, uh, the those are issues that, that are, are quite real. Hi, thank you. I know your topic is the criminalization of poverty. I just wanted to think about a little bit about the existence of poverty. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where you see us historically in the, a pattern, in 1930s, for mm. example, the country came together, many opponents, mm. but said, we've got to do something about this. In the 1960s, Lyndon Johnson did, and mm -hmm. Martin Luther King was cut short before his war on poverty. It seems like we maybe skipped the 90s. And where, where does that, in, in your study, where does that, that energy come from, mm -hmm. the force? Is it from, mm -hmm. is it from the federal government, local? Can it be from big yeah. business? I'm just wondering yes. where we might find that energy again as a country. Well, the first thing uh, th that I think we all need to understand, uh, and and uh, it's it's something where uh, I, I would want everybody in this room to be, shall I say, armed with what I'm going to say. Um, We've done a lot that works. And we, we didn't just do those things in the 30s or the 60s. Indeed, a lot of those things were done when Nixon was the president. Democratic Congress, but Nixon, uh, housing vouchers, for example, Pell Grants, uh, uh, having a national food stamp program, those, those all happened during Nixon. And the fact is, I mean, we, we uh, lowered po poverty f from, uh, uh, 22 percent in 1959 to 11 percent in 1973, and African American poverty went down from uh, 62 percent, uh, 50, yeah, 55 percent, sorry, to, to 31 percent. Um, if we didn't have the programs and policies that we have, we would, and this is all research and so on. Uh, we would have twice as much poverty, more about 90 million people instead of the 43 million that we have. And when we hear from Paul Ryan saying that none of it works, you tell him that he's full of it. Okay, that, that's, that's number one. Uh, ho hold on, it's, yeah. a, it's a little longer. Okay. I love you. Secondly, we need to understand there's still 43 million people who are poor. What's that all about? And it relates to the question that you're asking. I, just, I was just getting you the preface, but it's important. <laughs> uh, and that is that we, we've turned into uh, a, a, a low-wage country. And we've lost, and of course it's true uh, here in Cleveland and Ohio, and, and, but in much of the country. And so uh, those manufacturing jobs, which by the way didn't require you to even have a high school diploma, are gone. Uh, and, and the jobs, the good jobs that we have uh, going forward, and there aren't enough of them, um, is, requires much, much better education than we have right now. So that's a part of the answer. But the, the bigger part is how do we get people an income that might be partly from their job and we should have raised the minimum wage and so on, but we ought to look at all the different things that are, that are cash equivalents. Uh, healthcare we've done if we can hold on to it. Uh, child care is another one. Uh, housing vouchers is another one. Uh, the fact is with good public policy uh, and, and, and minimum wage, uh, we can get a long way toward having, uh, having more uh, income for people. Uh, and that would include low-income people who are in poverty because 70% of their income does come from, from work. Now, the thing is, how do we get a politics that does that? And I will tell you, I don't think that the Democratic Party is there. I don't think that they, ever since the 1970s, has, has t taken its responsibility to stand up about that issue and say, we need jobs and income, for, and, and, and that's at the heart of what we have to do. And so one of the reasons is we've let that slip and slip and slip, and there's all this anger out there that we, of course, saw it in, in 2016. And, and we, uh, as a Democrat, um, all the time when there was no people, it was just, people were just stuck, you know? 
in those low wage jobs. They never went up. Nobody really responded to them. So it's, it makes for, it's a real political challenge to, to, to uh, get back in the direction that we really need to go. Thank you for coming today. So the scale of the problem that you're describing is enormous. Mm -hmm. And yet until very recently, it was largely invisible. What explains that invisibility and what role does race play? Well, I, uh, you know, Robin, I don't precisely know why we didn't know. I think that people thought, uh, you know, it was kind of below the line, uh, below the radar. Um, oh, that happened to me, you know, or they're, just, they're doing it just in my town, uh, Bainbridge, Georgia, what have you. Um, we certainly didn't know it was a national policy, and that's we, all of us. Uh, and the, the journalists started, if you look back now, thinking about it. Uh, we're talking about it, but people weren't making the connection uh, of this one to that one to, to that one. So, uh, it's, it, uh, uh, it, at least in my thinking about it, what woke, it, woke us up was Ferguson. Um, that said, what do we do now is the rest of your question. Um, and I, I think we're, we're getting much more, for example, uh, it's only one aspect of it, but all the work that the lawyers are doing in terms of the specifics of the public defenders and the, and the uh, civil legal aid uh, lawyers, uh, but also the ACLU and the Center, Southern Center for Human Rights and the Southern Poverty Law Center and, you know, those, those kind of organizations that, that have a, a bigger role and, and can uh, take uh, Alec, who I talked about, uh, and getting all these other lawyers in, that's a kind of a piece to it. And the legislation that's popping up in, in various places, things that you're doing here in Ohio that are part of it. So th there is movement. Uh, the the, the uh, Chief justices uh, around the country have a very different view of it than they did 10 or 15 years ago when they seemed like they were happy to take the money and they kind of woke up to it and, and they're very much uh, playing a, re uh, a leading role now. The thing we don't have is the public engagement and that's where we need to, to have just ramp up uh, it means more in the journalism. It means more of the public leaders uh, talking about it publicly, uh, people who are public intellectuals, all of those kinds of things. Organizing the, the, the one piece that I have seen in the, in the research is what I told you about Prop 30, 47 in California. That was done by organizing. That was done by, by regular people knowing very well, not waiting for the legislature to act, but they themselves going and, and, and saying yes to that. So we need more of that. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Olmsted. I'm with St. Vincent Charity Medical Center. Right. You mentioned the need for private law firms mm -hmm. to support this effort. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I guess this is my attempt at uh, starting a public forum. But uh, we at St. Vincent started a medical legal partnership with the Legal Aid Society. Mm -hmm. and I. When you said that, I really felt compelled to let all of us know uh, that, and you know that, mm -hmm. uh, when we started that, found, that medical legal partnership, the Jones Day Law Firm, their mm -hmm. foundation in particular, mm -hmm. funded us to the tune of over a quarter of a million dollars mm -hmm. to be able to house uh, in the hospital a, an attorney that uh, would be working strictly with behavioral health and addiction patients. Mm -hmm. so I really wanted to make sure that that was known. No, oh, that's wonderful. Um, Georgetown Law has a medical partnership, legal partnership. Just want to let you know. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, you know, there are about 200 around the country, and it's an absolutely wonderful thing. And, and the, the fact that Jones Day did that, that that's absolutely uh, wonderful. Um, and uh, I, I do think, uh, relevant to that, uh, I said it, but I'll, uh, I'll say it a little differently which is uh, that over the year, and the lawyers in, in this will know this, that, that the, uh, the, the firms wanted to do uh, big this or that, you know, whether it's class action or whether it's capital punishment, they're all really important. Um, and uh, we're seeing around the country law firms who are responsive to do this work. That's new. Uh, and that's definitely, that's definitely something that's responsive to, to your question. 
Hi, how are you? Good. It was a pleasure to meet you earlier. Thank you for being here. Um, so uh, I'm a law professor at Case, as I mentioned to you. And by my estimation, the increase in technology has really allowed, I think, our government to erode the Fourth Amendment. With that being said, um, our county council just recently passed legislation to permit license scanners um, at various intersections throughout suburbs in our county. And I wonder if you have had any um, familiarity with those. Uh, purportedly, at this point, uh, we're being told that the license scanners are only to help find uh, cars that have been actively involved in a crime, so doing a particular search, uh, but that's exactly what they were originally for when the police officers, and, and we now know that they're able to scan um, any car that they pass at any point without probable cause or reasonable articulable suspicion. So I just wonder your thoughts mm -hmm. about that. Well, it's part of a gigantic uh, issue that we all face, privacy. Um, I mean, you know, you all have a, a, one of these in your pocket. They know where you are, so uh, it, it's and so we don't have the answer uh, in the big sense, because that's that's where we are, uh, and the, the so one of the things I would say you know we have cameras, and so on already that's a little different but the, we have that, um, one of the things that is can well be the case of what you're talking about is that it's done in a discriminatory way. And we certainly need to, at a at minimum, uh, if you're going to go go after the people, they should go after all the people, not just some of the people. Um, so uh, there was one. Uh, well, uh, I start the book uh, with uh, Vera Cheeks, uh, who had been arrested. This is a primitive version of that, but it's very effective. Um, she rolled through a stop sign. Well, oh, that's a cousin. Uh, and so the rest of the story is the same kind of story that I told you about her, uh, except she finally got a lawyer, which, which uh, uh, stopped the whole thing. Uh, and uh, a, a public defender from Tulsa told me uh, that there is a cop, who, a police officer, who uh, parks every, every day at the same um, uh, intersection uh, and arrests all the people who roll through. Now, uh, I have a little question about if you live there, why would you go, <laughs> why would you not stop? So maybe they're only getting people who aren't from there, but it's a black neighborhood, and it's not in the white neighborhood. So anyway, I haven't got a good answer for that, but I got an answer to some other question. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for coming today. So exactly along those lines, I wonder what the impact of rapid suburbanization in America has had on these policies and how we can compel suburban cities to change um, their views. Um, exactly along those lines, um, just an anecdotal evidence, I know when I zoom past a cop and I'm a white woman in a minivan, they don't stop, they wave. Um, but I know that if, if other people would, they would stop them and yeah. enforce um, I'm terrible policies. So how can we compel some of our suburban areas that were literally planned for segregation to change their policies? Well, it's just the, the same answer to um, uh, anything else. Uh, you have to do politics. I mean, you have to put together organizing that puts pressure on uh, that government and that police force uh, to uh, be, be fair about things and to be fair, I made a little joke, but to be fair to everybody, you know, not, not do the bad thing to everybody. Um, that, 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 that's it. And we certainly are going through, a, in, because these, this conversation impinges on a lot of other uh, things. Uh, you know, what about having chest fam uh, uh, cameras? Um, that's related to that. I mean, the whole question of, of driving while black is, is uh, you know, no, I don't have to write about that, because except I'd like to help stop it. Um, so uh, it's in that realm, and, and the, the short answer is uh, got to organize within that place, unless there's something you can do. But, you know, even if you have a law, then you have to, the, the people have to obey that law. The police officers have to do what the law said they should do or not do. So it isn't just getting the policy changed, then you have the problem of making sure they actually obey it. I, I wish I had something better to say, but I think that is essentially those are the tools that we have. 
Uh, you've talked about uh, legislative remedies mm -hmm. uh, for the driver's license problem mm -hmm. going to councils and changing that. Have there been successful litigation remedies around the country? And if so, why are those not being replicated? Uh, on driver's license? Or, yes, sir. Oh, that, that uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the lawyers who were uh, at the edge on this, uh, who, were, who were breaking the, 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 getting into new areas, just started. There's, there's a Tennessee court uh, that says, uh, a Tennessee suit uh, that argues that it's uh, rich and poor. Uh, that the people who can't pay, that therefore it's equal protection. And uh, why, uh, except that these lawyers who do this uh, have been doing it a re relatively short period of time, the, the chronology is first the fines and fees, and of course that's a lot of work to do. Secondly, the bail. And then they said, oh, uh, why, why don't we do that about the driver's uh, license suspension? So that's happening right now. Um, and so it's, it's a great question, and we need to see more cases brought. Now, all that's happened in that particular case uh, is, but it's a good thing, the judge uh, gave, gave a temporary restraining order. Um, so uh, you, it, there was, in other words, a, an affirmative uh, response to it. That was what your question? Yeah, oh, okay. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum with Peter Edelman, Karmic Waterhouse Professor of Law and Public Policy at Georgetown Law Center and author of Not a Crime to be Poor, The Criminalization of Poverty in America. Our forum today is sponsored by the Sisters of Charity. We have Sisters of Charity representatives with us today. Thank you so much for your generous support. It's also part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to many of you here today for your support of City Club programming through that public grant and your support of that agency. Today's forum is also the Stephen A. Minter Endowed Forum, made possible by, possible by generous contributions from the five member banks of the Cleveland Foundation in honor of Mr. Minter's retirement from the Cleveland Foundation. We're honored that Steve is with us along with his daughter, Robin Minter Smyers, Thank you very much for your leadership, your generosity, and your vision. Our community partners for today's forum include Cleveland Public Theater and the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We appreciate your partnership. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by the Center for Community Solutions and Thompson Hine. And we welcome students from the Flow Homeschool Co-op and Hawkins School. Student participation is made possible by many foundations, including the William M. Weiss Foundation. We thank all of you for being here today. The sale of Mr. Edelman's book, Not a Crime to be Poor, is provided by a cultural exchange, and that brings us to the end of our program, but not the end of the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Edelman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.